Welcome back. We are here at the Splunk 2012 User Conference, the third annual worldwide user conference. I'm Jeff Frick with SiliconAngle.tv. I'm here with my uh, partner, Jeff Kelly, from Wikibon.org, the uh, preeminent big data analyst. I kind of keep coming up with new... Uh, You're making me blush again. New adjectives. We've, we've been here uh, all day. This has been a great show. Uh, you're in the Cube, and the Cube is giving you the full day coverage, wall to wall, of what's going on here at the Splunk Show. We've had a number of uh, executives, customers, partners, and, and we'll continue for uh, wrapping up today. It's our last segment, I believe, Jeff, and then we will be back all day tomorrow. So we invite you to participate. We're glad you're along. Um, the theme for the show is Data Journey, so participate using hashtag Data Journey. And with that, let me kick it over to, uh, to Jeff Kelly. Great. Well, thanks so much. Uh, of course, we, we saved the best for last, Cube alum, uh, Ron Botkin, CEO, founder of Think Big Analytics. Uh, been on a number of times with us. Great to have you back. Jeff, always a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on here at the show, what you're doing here, and maybe just uh, for our new viewers who haven't seen you on the Cube, tell us a little bit about what you guys do, a professional services firm in the big data space. And... Uh, absolutely. So Think Big Analytics, uh, we're a professional services firm that's purpose built for big data. We started the company about two and a half years ago mm -hmm. with a real exclusive focus on helping the enterprise take advantage of the, all these new disruptive data capabilities that big data and big analytics, data science can create. And so we're, we're here because we're always excited about new technologies and in this fast moving mm -hmm. space, um, it's important to be aware of what's going on and you know, we're, we're watching Splunk closely. Yeah, I mean, you, so you're in a position uh, as a service provider to see a lot of the different players in the market from a technology perspective. Uh, what's your take on Splunk and kind of uh, maybe the uptick in adoption you might be seeing, or, or what, what's your take uh, out there in the field in terms of how Splunk's uh, being used? Absolutely. So we definitely see Splunk as having building on a heritage of machine data and search uh, to really uh, tackle some new use cases, integrating with big data technologies like Hadoop and NoSQL. So what we, we've seen, for example, we have a large credit card customer that is using Splunk to do operations on big Hadoop cluster to, to help them get their arm around uh, events that are going on the cluster to troubleshoot and diagnose things more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an example. You know, we see also people are using Splunk uh, to pull data into Hadoop clusters, to feed data into Hadoop. Mm -hmm. And we also see uh, Splunk going after the larger opportunity for uh, being a kind of platform for streaming real-time big data. And we think that that's still white space, that Hadoop is very established and effective mm -hmm. as a, a, a workhorse, a batch analysis and data science platform, but that as you get into re streaming real-time, that there's a number of approaches and that Splunk is really putting a lot of energy into being an effective platform there. Yeah, that's interesting because we're seeing a lot more activity in, in the uh, streaming big data. We saw a notable kind of change, change direction a little bit. They're focusing on that, and obviously Twitter's uh, open source storm platform is obviously another option. So uh, you know that's that's kind of the uh, kind of the white whale of the, uh, the big data play. We just make sense of uh, this data that's coming in in real time. Uh, so that you can do it fast enough so you don't lose the customer or that you can improve the process or catch the bad guy. Yeah, definitely streaming big data is a hot topic and mm -hmm. as you alluded to, to, in addition to Splunk, you've got technologies like Storm that are out there. Um, what we think is interesting too though is um, a lot of times there's a real blend that you want to do deep analytics. You want to be able to load all the data into, for example, Hadoop and do data mining, mm -hmm. analysis, detect uh, patterns and build models that then you push out to do near real-time response. You know, the, the most traditional, if you can say that, a way to do that in a big data space is to have a NoSQL database that holds all those models and you do differential updates to it as events come in. But what we're seeing is that as customers are starting to do more complicated patterns and flows of data in those real-time environments, they want to have a scalable infrastructure for managing all those data pipelines, the way it runs, that they want to have a fabric for the logic as well as a scale-out platform for the data. And that's where we're seeing the interest from more advanced users around these streaming big-time data platforms. So, so when you have these customers, are they, are they reacting uh, in fear that they, they've got to get a handle on what's going on and, and this is really a new investment and in new technology that they want to expand? Or is it more, you know, just a better ROI, more of a, of a shift in technology and, and really more of a cost savings driver that, that's driving these kind of purchase decisions? 
Oh, I think I think that there's, uh, you know, there, of course, an important other uh, motivation besides fear and cost savings, which is uh, opportunity to create new value, right? So we were working with a uh, media giant that's very excited about personalization and building intimate relationships with their customers. We're working with one of the largest retailers looking to drive very close, you know, improvements in how they, they put products in locations and working with customers and build intimacy. We're also working with uh, companies, large credit card companies that are doing things like targeting offers effectively to those consumers so they can be more accurate in the way they respond. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a range of, of companies that are driving personalization, driving intimacy, creating new businesses on top of big data, as well as cost cutting, and as well as, you know, fear is, is the flip side, which is if you're late in some of those requirements to create value, then you may have to respond, and it won't be on your own terms. Right. Instead right. of you defining the terms of how is the, the market shifting, someone else will do it, right? And we definitely see that there's an element of that starting to, to happen, that when you look at the pioneers of big data, the companies like my old company, Quantcast, or, or Google, or Facebook, or LinkedIn, eBay, that they, they are often creating new offerings and products and forcing incumbents and industries to respond. You know, if you look in the media industry, um, the, the challenge of the old guard that haven't been intimate with their customers is right. they're being intermediated. Right? They're finding that they're no longer allowed to have a direct relationship with their customer. They're being relegated to being a content provider to someone else who owns their customer. Right. Right? They're not being put out of business, but lack of facility to work with data and to build intimacy with customers is putting them in a very disadvantageous position. So we see enterprises waking up to the importance of investing in big data so they can create strategic value now instead of waiting for two years when they're, they're under the gun to respond to right. an unpleasant change in their industry. Right. And you know, as a services firm, how are you helping that transition? When you go into, into clients, I mean, you must see a mix of both startups that maybe kind of get that right away, and maybe older, uh, more traditional firms that maybe need a little more goading. And what's the uh, kind of strategy in terms of helping people make that, uh, make that connection of, hey, we've got to be proactive here, we can't wait. Uh, you know, wait the two years because then it's too late, we've been passed by. Sure, you know, definitely we see, we, we do a lot of work in the enterprise, mm -hmm. and one of the things we do is we have a envisioning services something we call a brainstorm, where we come in and we help customers really think through what are the ways that they can create differentiated value mm -hmm. out of their data, what are the new ways of working with data, what are the use cases that value add that apply to them in their industry, and let them really drive meaningful changes to their business. So that, that becomes a foundation, that co-creation of ideas mm -hmm. that drives into an execution program that's nimble with quick releases of value, that drives them to transform and creates that value in learning in the market for how to really differentiate and, and be part of the, the, the companies that are succeeding on big data. Right. So, so that's our general engagement approach. We think a lot of times the, the challenge for the enterprise is recognizing that this is a different game, that it's not a case of applying the playbook from last decade and, and going out and finding uh, commodity providers with low skills that you can ship a spec and have them build something. That This isn't about implementing a package that's a right. commodity. It's about creating something new and differentiated mm -hmm. that works for you. It's about your data and analyzing it flexibly and that's different than anyone else's. Mm -hmm. And it's about turning the equation backwards. So instead of the old IT mantra was, how quickly can we summarize and get rid of data? And the new mantra we <laughs> get is, how much data can I use to be mm -hmm. smart and create value? Right, so that's you know, how we engage with the enterprise. And when we engage with small, nimble firms, startups that are typically no longer startups, but growing, it's because they just want best in class expertise. That are, we've got brilliant engineers and data scientists who can provide acceleration and thought leadership in their programs, and they recognize that they have that what's most scarce for them is time, and that they can't afford to do it wrong or make mistakes. Mm -hmm. can, can, you, can you speak specifically to, to maybe a fast win um, say customer intimacy engagement, that you know, you, you got a big enterprise, they want to get closer, they're, they're afraid of the disintermediation, and you, you've come in, you've done your brainstorm. You know, what are some of the kind of quick wins that you can demonstrate to them, kind of the aha moment to the guy that's down at Mahogany Row that doesn't really buy it yet until you come in and show them? Sure, I mean, a lot of times we, we, we'll, we'll come in and we'll help customers put some of their data about customers together, so their customers, 360 degree customer view, and we've done things like helped provide immediate insight into 
what marketing and advertising channels were more and less effective to allow for decisions to drive better results. That then led to um, investment in how to start to uh, organize new data sets to start to build personalization programs to reach out to those customers. Okay. So those are examples of how you can quickly get in and start to get the data together, get some basic analysis and insight, and go from that to more proactive model building. Excellent. So, you know, one of the issues we, we've kind of seen over the, the last few years is that people sometimes get hung up on the technology. Um, and of course, this is a, you know, a, this is a big no-no. You don't want to just invest in the technology because, oh, everyone's talking about it. You think it might help you someday. And then you invest and you've got no use case. As you were talking about kind of quick wins. Um, how has that conversation changed with you? I mean, do you with your, your clients and the people you see in the, in the industry, is, are you going into, have there been any trends as, um, as you go into new engagements? in terms of their understanding of what big data is. Um, you know, big data does not necessarily equal Hadoop. Yeah. It can mean a lot of different things. And how's that perception changed uh, that you've seen? Well, I'd say that there's definitely over the last two and a half years we've seen, there's a lot more information out there, but there's also a lot more misinformation out there, <laughs> right? There's a lot of- Not at wikibon.org or Silicon <laughs> no, no, Angle. No, not here, not here, <laughs> but, but in other, uh, other outlets. Um, you know, that what you see is uh, a lot of times customers well, they've, they've read a lot and they're, they're, they're thinking about the problem, but they can be just paralyzed because there's so many options, right? And so one of the big things that we do is we help get a customer off the dime and say, you know, this is how you can get started. And we know a way to build this successfully, it's going to work. So instead of, we so often see companies that are stuck in an endless cycle of proofs of concept where they're trying out all the different technologies and not creating any value. And we want to guide customers to get started small, pilot something, and then build on that success. So keep rolling out incremental releases and, mm -hmm. and generate value. Yeah, that's interesting, because it, it kind of, uh, we, we were talking a lot today, we actually heard two or three times talk about DevOps, and the, kind of the, the, uh, the ability to kind of connect uh, development with operations and to quickly iterate and, and kind of release uh, you know, new applications and new use cases quickly. And that seems to be a real theme and a real important aspect of what makes big data so different than the way we used to do, we used to think of data management yeah. with a very structured, you know, a set in stone data model in an enterprise data warehouse. And if you had to change a data a fee, a source, data source, add one or take one away, you've got to, you know, change the whole model and you've got a whole big project under, underway. And that's really changing with this idea of big data. Um, do you think people are getting that? Are you still have to convince people about this kind of new way of doing things? Well, definitely, I agree that it's, it's a very important point about big data, that it's agile data. We started saying, look, we think there's really four Vs in big data. You know, everyone says volume, variety, and velocity. Mm -hmm. And that's true, but the, actually the, the most important V is value. Yeah. Your ability to get quickly value out of your data. So and how, how is that? It's because you can be agile in working with the data. And instead of committing up front to here's how we're going to organize the data and we'll get everything structured, right? The, the classic enterprise data warehouse is, well, we'll build a model that describes every question we'd ever want to answer. Yeah. And then once we've built it, then we'll have a perfect system, right. except right. that we'll never get there <laughs> and this business will have changed right. yep. and it will be, we won't let too many people access it because it's too costly, right? right? Those were the little drawbacks and the, the, the theory of the enterprise data mm -hmm. warehouse. So the, the big data approach of let's get in there, let's, let's put the data in in a raw form and let smart people start to make sense of it and answer questions, and we'll invest in what's working. When we've proven there's value in a way of organizing and structuring data, we'll structure, right? So you don't, in a big data system, you don't dump everything in raw bits and have no structure, but you structure things once it's been proven to be valued. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and that's a big shift. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Have you seen a change in kind of the sponsors, the, 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 the titles and the role of the sponsors of your engagements, and, and has that kind of shifted? Out of kind of the business and the pure business analytics or the or the data center type of folks into more of the business people and you know are we going to see you know chief big data officer here uh, before too long? Well, you know, definitely we see an increased partnership between business and technology. So whether it be a marketing group, whether it be um, product or engineering and a technology firm, whether it be risk management, right, you'll see the business partnering with the technology team, the IT team. And in fact, we think that's good. I, I get worried when you create a separate group that's, that's neither the business or the technology right. side right. As, as to whether they have the alignment and sponsorship. But it is important to have those close partnerships because this is about creating a, a technical capability. It's really about being scientific and changing the way you operate your business. It's making fundamental automated decisions uh, based on data, 
that's a big shift from yeah. how business has been done. And it takes that partnership that you need the business to really understand the metrics and understand where the value can be created. And you need the technologists to implement it and make it successful, hopefully with best in class support. Right. <laughs> right. And, then, yeah. and then ultimately deliver it to the line guys who, who don't fit either of those models, but are executing a lot of the, the little decisions um, in the day-to-day -day work too. Yeah, I mean, uh, we see that increasingly you want to automate the routine decisions and let people, the line workers, deal with the exceptions that right. can't easily be automated. So their work actually gets more interesting, but right. it also, it's a lot more efficient than having having to, to deal with everything you know, on a manual basis. Right, right. Uh, so we, we've talked about security use cases a lot today. What are you seeing out there in terms of uh, applying big data to kind of catch the bad guys, so to speak? We, we talked uh, with a few people today about that, that very topic, and I think it's getting a lot more uh, play these days with uh, you know, some high-profile data breaches. And what role can big data play in, in kind of uh, securing your infrastructure, but other, maybe even other parts of your business? Well, definitely big data provides you a lot of capacity and capability to work with information, to find patterns, to go back and mine historical data when you've seen a pattern and see what your exposure was, to correlate different data streams, and to start even starting to bring in unexpected data sets, like can you do text mining from news to find uh, people that might have a motivation now to break the law because they've they've just been convicted or gone bankrupt, or you know, th there's a variety of these kind of use cases where you might use interesting other data sets that you weren't traditionally thinking about to intersect and start to get some insight into your problem. What external data sets, what, what partner's data can you source and take advantage of in order to be effective in security? So we've worked with a number of large enterprises um, that have interesting data sets in this space that are looking at how do they build more effective security. You know, including, for example, predictive models to be able to find um, uh, malicious botnets before they're unleashed mm -hmm. on the world. Right. <laughs> right. That's that's the whole. That's the key. Right. Before it does the damage, or or quickly well, thereafter. Both. I mean, you yeah. want to be able to predict it before it happens, but it's also often the case that as something is developing, being able to characterize it and respond quickly right. can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, well, we are uh, you know got time for one more question, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing in the coming six months, year. What are your priorities? Because I think, uh, you know, I like to ask all our guests that. That really helps us understand kind of where this market's going. What are your priorities at Think Big Analytics, and what are you guys really uh, jazzed about? So, you know, at Think Big, we continue to be super excited about how the enterprise can take advantage of big data and create value, and we see that really maturing in this next six months as, we, as companies are really starting to go beyond proofs the concept and, and invest in putting together the infrastructure in order to not only nimbly create applications, but start to do data science and, and create advanced analytics on top. So we're seeing this maturation. The enterprises tried uh, some of the toe dipping and realized what is it really going to take to succeed here? And we're seeing uh, a lot of excitement going into the fall and next year uh, for really taking advantage of big data to create unique business value and connect with customers. All right, cool. And, and so how do, how do potential customers uh, link up with you guys? So definitely, uh, it's, we always welcome hearing from customers on our website, thinkbiganalytics.com. You know, follow us on Twitter. I'm Ron Bodkin, at Ron Bodkin on Twitter. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here today. All right, great. Yeah, if you're, if you're thinking about starting a big data practice, definitely uh, look these guys up. Think Big Analytics, uh, doing some really interesting work. Ron, right, thanks so much for being here again. We appreciate Jeff, it. We'll see you. you again soon, I'm sure, on the Cube. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ron. And Jeff, I think that about wraps it up for today. Uh, you're watching the Cube, Silicon Angle's premier video production. We're here live at .conf 2012, Splunk's end user conference, third annual, here at the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas. Uh, we've had a, a long uh, but a very interesting day with a lot of great guests. Uh, we're going to be back tomorrow morning around 10 a.m. Uh, for another complete day of coverage. Um, any final thoughts you wanted to want to share with the audience, Jeff? That was fantastic. Uh, it's just great to have a, a service provider on who is kind of sits above the technology stack, helps customers kind of sort their way through. Where do I go? You know, what are my options? Where do I start? How do I deliver value? I think I think your your fourth V on on big data is incredibly insightful and something that should be more widely adopted by by more people because it is ultimately about the value. It is you know what is this worth to me. 
Well, thank you. You know, we definitely think there's a need for this new breed of integrator that's specialized in big data, yeah. and we're excited to be there. Yeah, yeah, I think that's you're in a great spot and, and, and really a great way to close out our day, Jeff. So I'm glad you saved the best for last. Although, <laughs> don't tell the uh, tell Eric and Rob that. We we'll keep that to ourselves. Well. So thanks so much. <laughs> uh, thanks for uh, being with us today. Uh, we had a great time. We'll be here, be back here tomorrow morning, as I mentioned, 10 a.m. Uh, please join us then. You can follow us. Uh, the Cube hashtag, of course, and Data Journey hashtag is uh, the hashtag here for the uh, Splunk conference. Uh, but we'll see you here tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Pacific at siliconangle.tv. The Cube. <laughs>